Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. Medical research is often constructed as being above or beyond cultural context. Medicine is based upon objective study, right? Scratch the surface of this narrative, however, and you find that the history of medical advice is riddled with well-meaning but inaccurate guesses, reinforcement of prejudices, and out-and-out -out social control mechanisms. Read the history of how medicine has treated women or people of color, and you read a history of junk science, the assertion of cultural beliefs and colonial attitudes shrouded in the language of objectivity and science. One would like to think that Western medicine has grown past that point, but an examination of the current research on obesity is a case in point that medicine remains firmly within the boundaries of culture and is susceptible to the same economic, political, and social forces it always has been. A great deal of press is given to any research that asserts any kind of connection between being fat and having poor health. Little press is given to the funding of such research, which often comes from the diet industry. In fact, little or no critique is ever made of this kind of research. The relationship between fatness and disease is such a given now in medical discourse that few people even question the validity of the assumption. However, the researchers who have questioned obesity as a factor in health have found some interesting and seemingly counterintuitive results. Many of the studies indicating the fatness is related to a number of diseases and early death do not control for important factors such as physical activity, dieting, weight fluctuation, diet drug use, and poverty. In studies where these factors are taken into consideration, the relationship between being fat and illness and or early death disappears or sometimes even becomes a positive one where fatness enhances health. If you've ever taken a basic undergraduate statistics class, you've probably heard the example of the researcher who, quote, proved, close quote, that smoking among teenage girls caused pregnancy. There is a statistically significant relationship between smoking in girls and pregnancy. Further examination shows that girls who engage in smoking behavior are often the same girls who engage in sexual relations. Having sex, not smoking, is what causes pregnancy and the, quote, scientific evidence, close quote, is a lot more rigorous on this point than on the rhetorical precepts underlying the attacks on fat people. Being fat might be statistically related to illnesses and or early death, but correlative links cannot conclude that causality exists, only suggest connection of some unspecified sort. Some studies have indicated that fat people who are active and eat well live longer and have fewer diseases than their thinner but less active junk food eating counterparts. Other studies have indicated that dieting itself may be leading to illnesses and early death. The so-called cure may be more dangerous than the so-called disease. So why is the diet industry a multi-billion dollar industry? Why did 40 to 50 percent of North Americans start a diet on New Year's Day and make the resolution to lose weight this year? This week on First Person Plural, we spoke with Francie Berg, a nutritionist who is trying to help us question dieting, weight loss schemes, and the damage we are doing to ourselves and our children with our fear of fat. To highlight her message, Berg helped start Healthy Weight Week, celebrated annually the third week of January. Her message is simple. We should be promoting health at every size. And that is what we called this episode of First Person Plural. On your website, you talk about encouraging health at any size, and especially this kind of approach to eating and exercise. Um, so tell, tell us a little bit about what that means. Yes, okay. Um, health at any size, or some people call it health at every size. It has some alternate names. Is is about people being healthy at the size they are. It seems like uh, the traditional medical thinking has been that First you lose weight and you get down to this ideal size, and then we help you be healthy. Well, that hasn't worked <laughs> for the last 20 or 30 years. As you know, people have been trying to lose weight by all these different methods. They have failed, and mostly it's been weight cycling back and forth. 
the health at any size approach is we help you now to get as healthy as possible. And it's all about lifestyle, living um, more actively is one of the main things, and then also eating well, trying to eat in ways that are um, natural and normal, which means usually eating three meals a day and one or two snacks instead of uh, grazing through the day. Mm-hmm. And uh, tuning into the body's natural signals. And that's really important for our kids if we can help them to uh, eat when they're hungry and stop when they're full. Mm-hmm. And then we'll have far fewer eating problems and far fewer weight problems. There are a lot of people, you mentioned the medical approach to this, but you're making a case that people can be fat and be healthy at the same time. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. We have just lots of... Uh, examples of that and research that shows that. In fact, the the research that shows people who are, you know, heavier people are less healthy, um, most of that research does not separate out the active people. And um, at the aerobic center, the Cooper Aerobic Center in uh, Dallas, they've been doing that research for 20 years, and what they're finding is that people, uh, and the first research was done on men, men who were more active, it really doesn't matter the size they are. It matters their activity and their fitness. And uh, men who are more fit and more active uh, live longer and are healthier. And uh, now they've been doing research on women probably for about the last 12 years and seeing the same things for women. Great. You've published two books, Women Afraid to Eat and Children's and Teens Afraid to Eat. Why do you think we are afraid to eat? How does weight obsession lead to this kind of relationship with food? Um, it certainly has, and the emphasis we have in our country and in Canada, throughout North America, on and really throughout the world, on thin is is the ideal, and it's really an obsession with thinness. And um, the ideal woman, <laughs> and men are not far behind on this, by the way, <laughs> mm. but it's sort of led by women. The ideal woman size has um, been reduced by a, one third in the last. Uh, 20, 30 or 40 years. Marilyn Monroe was, uh, was an average size woman, about 12 to 14, size 12 to 14. Now that's a little different in Canada. I'm not sure how that translates. And it's not but, that different. Okay, she, she was an average, she was an average size woman and that was, uh, that was fine. But now the average size woman or the ideal woman in the news media is about um, a size one Two or maybe even zero, and most women cannot be that size in a healthy way, and but they're trying to. <laughs> so consequently, we have just enormous problems. I I look at six main problems that we're having uh, as a result of of our eating and our mixed up that we're not eating normally, we're not listening to our body signals, and also the fact that people are so much less active than they used to be. And these six problems are, one of them is overweight, one's eating disorders, dysfunctional eating, which is just a big area. Probably 80% of women are eating dysfunctionally at some time or other. Another one is undernourishment, and this is particularly uh, a problem with our teenage girls. Many of them are very much undernourished. Another problem is the hazardous weight loss methods Mm -hmm. that so many people are using and uh, really is injuring and also killing (laughs) quite a few people. Mm -hmm. And then the sixth one is size prejudice, and this is also a big, big problem that leads to to many problems. I, I think a lot of people might be surprised that a discussion about dieting would lead one to think about making people afraid of eating. Um, I think that there's a lot of people who would think, well, if you go on a good diet, in other words, if you if you lose weight in a healthy way, then wouldn't that lead to a better relationship with food? But after reading your website, it seems like what you're saying is that just the whole concept of dieting creates a problem. It does. And dieting by its very nature is restricting food. It's eating less than your body wants. And now, mind you, many people are eating more than their body wants because they've also lost touch with their body signals. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you're eating less than your body wants, then then the the whole um, 
the whole physical self starts to dry in on itself and shut down, and also the mental uh, person shuts down. And so people who are dieting tends, tend to be less than they really could be. So they're putting their whole lives on hold. It, it gets to be a cycle. People go on this diet on Monday morning and they lose weight for three days, and then they um, blow the diet, they binge about two or three times a year, a, a chronic dieter will usually go on a major diet, which maybe lasts longer. Maybe it lasts for a couple of months. But the longest that weight loss, that a, a weight loss diet seems to be successful is about six months. And then even if they continue the diet, they will start to, to gain back the weight just because of the body adjustments. You're suggesting, too, that the deprivation is, is setting this up. So no matter what the good intention is here, just the the physical part of it, of going on the diet, depriving, you know, depriving yourself from the calories that you need and putting yourself out of touch with your own body signals kind of sets up that cycle? Yes, yes. Uh, I call it the starvation syndrome. In, in my books, Women uh, and Children Afraid to Eat, there is a chart that shows all of the things that can happen or that do happen when a person uh, restricts calories. There are, there are many emotional things that happen as well as we kind of think it's, uh, it's physical things, mm -hmm. but uh, it's also emotional things, too, that happen. Well, if I could ask a rhetorical question at this point, shouldn't dieting lead to a better relationship with food? <laughs> you would think so, and, and that's the basis that people have been dieting all this time, but uh, sometimes going on a well-balanced diet helps a person learn how to eat better and to eat um, better foods, but uh, it's the restriction that's causing the problem. Um, babies know how to eat. Babies eat when they're hungry and they stop when they're full. They're, they cry when they're hungry, <laughs> so mm -hmm. you, you know. And somewhere before kids get to be about five years old, in our current society where we're trying to restrict what everybody eats and trying to get them to eat more of this and less of that, before about five years old, kids are eating in a natural way, and we should let them eat that way. Ellen Satter, who is the feeding specialist for children, um, well-known nationally and internationally, has uh, given the golden rule for feeding children. It, it's a really a, a good one for parents because parents... Uh, Parents sometimes try so hard, and uh, and it it can be making the problem worse. Mm -hmm. So Ellen's uh, rule is that parents are responsible for putting the food on the table, the meal, bringing the food into the house that they think is good food, and then parents must stop. And children are in charge of how much and even whether they eat. So children should come to the table. They should sit there, but uh, they should not be forced to eat anything. They, or, they or prevented pardon? or prevented from eating anything right exactly so if they want two servings of of hot dish or whatever it might be or three pieces of bread um, they should just be let to do that on the other hand they shouldn't be urged to eat more or if you eat your beans you can have dessert parents get into all kinds of emotional tanglements <laughs> when they start trying to to ma micromanage what children are eating a That's great right. negotiation at dinner, huh? <laughs> exactly. And uh, parents get concerned sometimes because the child might eat only bread for a day and nothing else. It will even out, average out. And um, many times children don't like a new food, and so parents get concerned. But if the parents eat it and other people at the table are eating it, uh, eventually the children will eat it. Mm hmm so I think that's that's really a good uh, golden rule, and I, I hope the parents uh, who are listening will, will try to think how that can fit into their lives. With their You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM, Victoria.
this next week, January 19th through the 25th, is uh, the ninth annual Healthy Weight Week, and yes. which is part of why we decided to do the show right now. Yes. And uh, it seems to me January is a good month for something like that. Can you give us a little bit of history and um, uh, maybe talk a little bit about why you chose January? Healthy Weight Week is the third week in January. I guess we, we said at that time because the first New Year's Day people go on their diet and make their New Year's resolutions to lose weight. By the second week, the diets are dumped, the binges are over, and uh, people are looking for some reasonable and healthy ways to get their lives back on track. And they can find this by um, celebrating Healthy Weight Week with activities that promote healthy lifestyle habits that um, can be long-term in their lives and do prevent eating and weight problems. Mm -hmm. It's a time to say, I'm okay and you're okay, and stop this uh, on-again, off-again dieting and yo-yoing weight, which can be a health risk in itself, and move on to being healthy at our natural sizes. So what kind of issues, you, you do you talk about eating disorders, about eating healthy? Are there other kinds of issues that come up during uh, oh, there, uh, there celebrating are, this week? We mostly don't look at the negative things. We look at the positive ways of being more active. And I think um, we need to talk more about being more active. It seems like people are, they are overwhelmed by food restriction advice, and they're underwhelmed by exercise advice. And then people, what are people hearing? You know, if you tell people to be active and eat well, what they're hearing is, oh, sure, I should be active, but I'm not going to do that. You know, that's too much trouble, so I'm going to restrict what I eat. So we have lots of people restricting the fat, restricting the sugar, restricting all of the foods they eat, and then forget that it would be, <laughs> it would be probably much more to their advantage if they would be active, spend that time being more active. And when you say be active, I think one of the things that people start thinking of is, oh, God, it means I'm going to have to join at the gym and go down and stand on the treadmill for half an hour and sweat really bad and do this, you know, like two times a day, seven days a week. Exactly. And that's really the old um, weight-centered paradigm. I have to, you know, to eat off a cookie, I have to run two miles. The new uh, approach, the health at any size approach, is one of enjoying being active and being active your own way every day. That is uh, one thing that <laughs> that uh, in our culture people tend to, to do. They have to go on a big diet. They have to buy some exercise equipment, join a gym, pay some big fee, and then they think they will um, be successful. But um, it's really more successful to go by through little steps and I like to uh, encourage people to just start with five minutes a day for a whole month. If we would walk five minutes a day for a whole month, and this winter time, it doesn't have to be outside. It can be in the house. It can be in front of the television, or it can be just uh, marching in place. Mm -hmm. But if people would start by walking five minutes a day for four weeks and then start to increase maybe six minutes for another month, now, nobody's going to get fit in five minutes, but what is going to happen is that um, we can change a habit. Mm -hmm. We can change a habit in four weeks, and then if we're consistent, we can keep that habit. In, in that five minutes a day, uh, you can find out what time of the day works best for you to have some that activity. Mm -hmm. You'll learn a lot of things, what kind of activity you like. But uh, being active in the, the health at any size approach means uh, that it's part of your life. It makes you feel more energetic, and you move for the sheer joy and power of it. Um, you choose fun activities. And another thing to be creative in adding activities throughout the day. I decided what I'm going to do this winter is park at least a, a block away from the store or whatever I'm going to, instead of trying to find that parking place that's right outside the door. <laughs> And that mm -hmm. gives me an extra couple blocks that I'll walk just um, just as, as part of the, the trip down in my car. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the ways that I've gotten more active is uh, to I actually have a cat that walks on a leash. But, I mean, you know, if you have a dog or something like yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, pets can be a way of getting you out and about. 
playing with them, walking with them, that kind of thing. Right, they certainly can. And maybe just playing with them, maybe just playing out in the yard. A dog is so much fun. I do that, too. I, I walk with my dog. And, and then you find when you don't go out, the dog feels so bad. <laughs> He'll guilt you into it. <laughs> <laughs> it really brings you up. <laughs> Another thing about being active uh, with this new approach is we're not being active to lose weight. And this is such a, such a crime that's been done to women, I think, that women exercise to burn calories. Mm-hmm. You know, what a depressing uh, reason to, to be active. We should enjoy the benefits. Uh, we increase our energy. We lower our stress. We meet new people, you can sleep better, and improve your health in just many ways, long-term health. And bone strength, uh, uh, bones are stronger, more resistant to illness. Mm -hmm. There are so many health benefits to being active. And, of course, one of them is maintaining the weight that a person is. Mm -hmm. And this is a worthwhile goal, just to maintain the weight that you are, even for a larger person. Yeah, to get away from the yo-yoing of up and down... Right. Weight loss, weight gain, Absolutely. that kind of thing. And even getting away from adding a pound every year. There are mm-hmm. lots of people who do add one or two pounds a year. And if we can just be active enough to to stabilize our weight at a certain place. Now, I should say that doesn't work for women. <laughs> at mm-hmm. When they get to be a certain age, maybe in their 40s and 50s, most women will put on 10 or 15 pounds. And there's probably not much we can do about that. Mm-hmm. I I have a tip for women. It uh, often goes on your tummy, so the tip that I tell women when I'm giving a presentation is what you do is buy your pantyhose one size longer, <laughs> and that takes care of it. <laughs> so well, I know I work as a, um, a gerontologist, oh, and yeah. um, one of the things that I've seen is that seniors who are thinner, when they get up into their 70s and 80s, actually have some difficulties because um, what happens is that after the age of 60 or so, you start losing a pound or two a year, yeah. and it can actually create more frailty. Oh, yeah. So this is not something that, uh, this is more of a theory on my part than anything that's actually been seen, but I suspect that one of the reasons why we gain a little right after menopause and right before we go into our senior years is that we need a little bit of that weight. Yes, to deal I, with aging as we live longer. Yes, I believe that too, and I, I have seen research that backs that up. Bones tend to deteriorate at that age for women after menopause. Women who and men who are a little larger, who have a little more weight, always have stronger bones. Almost invariably, they have less uh, bone fractures, less uh, osteoporosis and all of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I do, I, too, I believe that it is a protective thing. Um, also, there is research that shows... Uh, women can be a little heavier in their older years and probably live longer. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get the time away from us without talking about uh, uh, a little bit more about the uh, Healthy Weight Week. Yes. Um, Maybe we could talk about the awards that we give. Sure. Uh, Two different awards are being given this week, the Women's Diversity Awards and the Slim Chance Awards. Tell us a bit about these awards and about the 2003 recipients. Okay. Uh, the Slim Chance Awards, is, this is the 14th year that we have presented these awards. And it's given on Tuesday of that week, which is called Rid the World of Fad Diets and Gimmicks Day. If only we could do that. They just pro- proliferate now that we have the, the Internet. And so we've picked the four, what we call the four worst diet products and services of the past year. And we've done this every year for 14 years. Uh, so the worst product we have are the Goryeb hypnosis seminars. Not sure if uh, Ron Goryeb comes up to Vancouver and Victoria in that area, but um, certainly travels the United States, mo- goes, books into a hotel, and um, charges $39 only for people to come. But the trick is that there, there is hard sell for overpriced uh, uh, pills and hypnosis tapes that um, people are very much encouraged to buy. Uh, worst gadget is called L- La Patch. <laughs> this is um, a uh, an appetite patch, which uh, some people call snake aid on snake oil on a band aid. <laughs> <laughs> it's billed as um, an advanced appetite suppressant and metabolism builder booster. Um, they can advertise pretty much what they want on email spam. Um, the worst claim. We've picked an HGH product, 
and HGH stands for human growth hormone, um, which is a natural hormone in the body that uh, people don't have as much of as they grow older, and a lot of scams are built on this <laughs> human growth hormone. This one sounded the most dangerous to me of the of the four that you talked about. Is well, or well, I don't know. It might be a toss up with that and the. Uh, I think Fedrin. all of the pills can be dangerous. Now, I don't think that Band-Aid is going to hurt anybody very much. <laughs> <laughs> but when the, when the hustlers start selling pills, then I think we need to, to think real carefully about taking them. Mm-hmm. Um, the, let's see, the second one, the most outrageous is Nutramerica's Trim Spa. Now, this, uh, this is also a pill, and this one, one of the ingredients is ephedra. And ephedra that mm-hmm. we know is uh, is very possible to cause serious adverse effects and even death. FDA has many many complaints about ephedra. Yeah, it's been controversial in Canada as well, and I believe it's uh, not possible to get the herb in Canada anymore. Really, but um, I wonder if you can sell. Um, you know, it's it's actually used in some cold pills as well. Yeah, I'm 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 not really clear on the um, the regulations that they have now about it. I know that there's been a lot of controversy about it here, though. Yes, there certainly is in the U.S., and, and they've tried very hard to ban it, but um, it's uh, not easy. <laughs> so uh, those are our worst product, worst gadget, worst claim, and most outrageous. We're talking about health at every size this week. If you'd like to explore this more fully, please visit our website, fpp.culturalconstructioncompany.com, and click on this week's episode, number 31. You will find links to Francie Berg's work, as well as a number of articles and resources to help you understand obesity research and the relationship between fatness and health. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV-FM in Victoria, British Columbia. Then uh, if we move on to the Women's Diversity Awards, a few years ago we decided to honor businesses that uh, show women's diversity, especially size diversity. A great new catalog I wanted to, um, is one of the, the best catalog. We picked something called Girlfriends LA. And this can be found on the Internet. It's a, it's a great catalog for, for young girls. They're mostly junior sizes. And... <laughs> The, the pictures show girls of different sizes, and every garment in the, in the catalog can be purchased at sizes from XS to 4XL. So Women, it's extra small. Extra small to extra, extra large. Right. Now, isn't this amazing? Can you imagine a woman's catalog who did that? No, I've never that. seen one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure there's not one, not one that I've ever heard of. But why not? I mean, um, oh. if it's a T-shirt or a blouse or pants, and that's, this catalog is just really neat. So that's why we picked it as the best catalog. We picked um, the best um, stage show hairspray. Yeah. Uh, we usually pick a television show or a network, mm-hmm. and we picked the stage show. This is the Broadway smash hit musical. Yeah, it's based on uh, John Waters' movie. Uh, yes, I believe so. Yes. So it um, it what actually is showed... The, is the movie called Hairspray? Yeah, Hairspray? I believe it is. Okay. Um, it actually showed in Seattle, which is not far from here. Mm-hmm. I don't know, I guess about four or five months ago. Oh. So it has come through here. This is the, the play. Yeah, the, the play. The show. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's about um, doing what you believe in, whatever your age, whatever your size or ethnicity. And um, the star is, uh, <laughs> I believe she wanted to be on a on a TV dance show, and her mother said, no way at your size. It, it touches the audiences. Yep, she actually gets the cute guy in the end, too. So. She does, okay. <laughs> 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 and then we picked the best magazine, Glamour Magazine, now, that was the big surprise for me. I, I know. It surprises people. Um, I have reviewed the uh, at least five or four or five issues of Glamour of the past year, and the amazing thing that Glamour has done is to picture women with curves in larger hips and stomachs. Now, Glamour has been talking about this for quite a few years, 
um, talking about some size acceptance and some of these things. But I don't believe that they've pictured very many women mm -hmm. that uh, break the stereotype a little bit. And uh, I'm just so happy to see that, that Glamour has done that. Glamour even showed before and after pictures of, um, well, they had a breast implant, for example. And the before picture was an actress with the breast implant. The after one was without them, and she said, I decided I wanted to be my real self. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, there are several pictures of before pictures of uh, of women, larger women in in boxy, baggy clothes that kind of hide their shape, and then the after picture are tight, hip hugging clothes in bright colors, and and they also wanted to be themselves. So this is quite a switch from what we've been seeing. Very cool. It is cool. <laughs> well, um, we're about out of time here, and I want to make sure that you get a chance to tell us about your new book before we take off here. Oh yes. Yeah. And, and also, I want to mention uh, that people can go to the website. We, we need to give them that address. Um, Definitely. Yes, it's, it's healthyweight.net. So right. Healthyweight is one word, dot .net. Right, and we want to emphasize the dot .net because uh, the dot .com ain't it. <laughs> oh, right. If you go to dot .com, you get a pill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you try that? Yeah, yeah. I've, uh, I've uh, gotten... Um, sent to the wrong website a couple of times trying to find you. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, well, so. It's the net. It's the yes. network. Um, the new book is um, Underage and Overweight. It's Amer about America's uh, childhood obesity problem and what every parent needs to know about it. I've, uh, this is going to come out uh, very soon, huh? and uh, I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to show, I, I hope it's going to help parents to see how they can work uh, help their children develop a healthy lifestyle that they can be on long term for well for life, and it includes a seven step plan uh, for raising healthy weight children, not just children who are larger, but uh, it does focus on on larger children. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's not a diet and exercise plan. Um, it follows the health at any size or the health at every size approach of. Uh, and, and I guess we didn't say the four things in the health at any size approach. One is live actively. Two is eat well. Three is feel good about yourself. And the fourth is feel good about others. Mm -hmm. Now, since we're in Canada, I might say that this is based on the Canadian Vitality Program, oh. which we uh, saw quite a bit of about oh, 10 years ago. And we don't hear a lot about it now, but uh, it's, uh, it's based on that. And also the health at any size approach is, very much coming out of Canada. There's a lot of strength of, of leadership in Canada, so I uh, thank you, <laughs> Canadians, for that. Excellent. Um, it's a little harder in the United States because we have this tremendous weight loss industry, which is so powerful here, and, and I think that's been a, a barrier to uh, learning healthy lifestyles as a solution for weight problems. Well, there's a pretty strong industry here. Most of um, Most of the American companies, sort of the leaders in the industry, have been imported in here. You can find <laughs> Jenny Craig's and all of those kind of things, yes. Weight Watchers. And, and all of the, the diet pills. I, yeah, I'm not quite sure which diet pills are approved in Canada. I, there is more regulation of herbs here than there is in the States. Oh, good. But it, nonetheless, a lot of schemes still find their way here. Yes, I'm sure. So. Um, well, Underage and Overweight is a book about solutions for parents who are concerned about weight and eating problems in their children, um, or if they only want to help their children lead healthier, more active lives, which and feel good about themselves. This means uh, reducing stress, building self-esteem. Parents need to be able to communicate better with their children, um, and sometimes it's just time. You know, one of the things that teenagers need more than anything from their parents these days is time mm -hmm. and uh, we all know everybody's so busy but uh, it's such an urgent thing to do at this stage in kids lives do you it's see a, a rise in the stigmatization of larger children with this emphasis on childhood obesity well there certainly has been for uh, in the very past few in the most recent years I think I'm seeing a little bit of relaxing of that. Good. Now, that is kind of, um, you know, we get so much uh, information now from the government on, you know, every few months there's another percentage of kids that are overweight, so there's a lot of pressure 
on this. But I think uh, some of our size activists have done a very good job in the media also in presenting their uh, side of the issues that, um, okay, if I am this size and I'm not able to lose weight, what about it? You know, yeah. what about it? Why not be teach me to be healthy <laughs> yes. or help me to be healthy? Yes, I think that's especially important with kids. Oh, it is. Because it, so sets, it sets you up. If you worry so much when you're a kid, I know this is my own personal experience about body size and that kind of thing. It just sets you up for a lifetime of having to deal with this. Right. And we might talk about some of the things that parents, you know, some of the important things parents can do as far as self-esteem for a larger child. Mm -hmm. And uh, this will also be in my new book. One of them is to love and accept your child unconditionally. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter their weight or whatever, but this helps them to love and accept themselves. And then treat size and shape as uh, that just contributes to a person's uniqueness. It's not, um, it doesn't define a person. A person is still an individual, a unique individual. Mm -hmm. Um, And parents need to examine their own biases. Now, if they happen to be slim and the child has more excess body fat, the parent has to ask themselves, what is their concern here? Is your concern for yourself or your child? Mm -hmm. Uh, Sometimes parents feel embarrassed and and might feel that um, people are uh, putting pressure on them to do something about this child. And uh, that is another problem with having a larger child is there there is a pressure, and and parents need to resist this and do what what they really believe is best for the whole child. And, you know, when we think of a person's weight, that's only one aspect. We need to look at wellness, and this is one thing I I look at, wellness for the whole child, which uh, takes in not just weight or the whole physical part, but it takes uh, in uh, emotions, social dimensions, intellectual Mm -hmm. Uh, spiritual, and then occupational, which for a child would be usually school. Mm -hmm. All of these uh, aspects are part of wellness, and so we need to look at the total child, and who is better better to know and understand the total child than the parent. And so parents need to rely on their own good sense. They need to trust themselves, and they need to trust the child. We're out of time. Oh, okay. But uh, I want to make sure that people know that we'll we will put up links to your website on oh, our website. Oh, great. Let's say the website again. It's healthyweight, one, all one word, dot yes. net. Yes. And I'm sure that you'll have information when your book comes out on yes. where people can uh, get the book if they're interested. Right. And it's, we very much appreciate you talking to us today. And maybe we can talk again, in fact, when the book does come up. That that sounds good. We'll at least make sure people know that it's out. Okay. Okay. So Thanks. good to talk to you, Patty. Thank and you very all. much. Good Thanks to for your answering. audience in Victoria. Good to hear from you. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM. 104.3 cable and on the internet cfuv.uvig.ca giving sociology an edge do you know why i hate january january yes i hate january the post christmas letdown no And I don't have anything particular against the month, but I hate being in January in this culture. And the reason is that everybody in the world talks about dieting in January. And it drives me out of my mind. I can't turn on the freaking TV or the radio or go down the street or talk to my friends or do anything without weight loss coming up and most specifically going on whatever this year's diet is. So not the post-Christmas letdown, but the post-Christmas slim down. And we now must be punished. That's the way Mardi Gras works, isn't it? Where you have the great big party and then you go do Lent. The non-Catholic Mardi Gras is have a great big holiday season and then punish yourself in January by restricting your food. That's not why it drives me nuts the most. The reason it drives me nuts the most is that inherent in all of this 
is fat hatred. And I don't mean just hatred of your own body fat. I mean hatred of fat people. Because the other people who come out during this time are fat haters. And most specifically the ones who like to shroud themselves in science. Uh, the latest thing is this month's JAMA issue. JAMA, by the way, is the journal for the American Medical Association, which used to be fairly prestigious, but now they don't have a panel, an independent panel, critiquing their articles. And so a lot of things slip into JAMA now that are funded by people who have a certain agenda. And there are lots of people with agendas around fat hatred. Uh, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So we found out about something that's sort of a voice of sanity in the midst of what I affectionately call hunting season, because January is hunting season on the fat, and that's Francie Berg and her Healthy Weight Week. So I kind of enjoyed interviewing her because I've always liked her website, and I've referenced her website several times, and have used her website personally to check out things and um I'd like to insert a couple of North Dakota jokes here, one of which is actually on point. Okay. One is that North Dakota has a reputation of being the place that Manitobans go to to get away from it all. <laughs> and the other is actually sort of on point. It's more of a joking question. Do you think that fat hatred would be less pronounced in areas with a small population per square mile? No, I actually don't. I think fat hatred is pronounced everywhere in North America. Um, I'm going to take it seriously, even though you're kind of joking around. I My bet is that they don't make room for the fat people in North Dakota either. That it's just as, just as many chairs that you can't fit in, just as many buses you can't fit on, just as many airlines you can't fit on, just as many theaters, etc., uh, maybe not as many as you find in a big city, but I think that it probably is still a world in which it's not one size fits all and it's not accommodating. And I mean, the world is just built around a certain view of what the human body should be. And we can debate all day long why people are larger than that ideal and there are lots of reasons, and since nobody actually studies it directly or studies it without medicalizing it, we just don't know why people are fat. But what we do know is that fat people exist and that fat people are intelligent people, they're productive people, they are good citizens, they are human beings with feelings, taking good care of themselves, sometimes better care than, of themselves than their thin counterparts because they've learned that they have to take good care of themselves because they don't have access to the same kind of medical advice and the same kind of care that their thinner counterparts do. One thing that I really like about Francie Berg is that she is connecting this obsession with dieting and with food restriction, especially among women, with the fat acceptance movement, that if we do not accept people as they are, where they are right now, and help them, support them in being the healthiest people that they can be, then we are in the end setting up a system in which all of us end up being afraid of what we eat and afraid of who we are. What she didn't get into in the interview that I think I see as a sociologist is that this is systematic. It's about advertising. There are a lot of people who make a lot of money making us as consumers dissatisfied with our own bodies. And the more dissatisfied we feel, the more likely we are to go and purchase whatever fad thing is available this week to try to improve our bodies. And there is a particular agenda that these funders have, and they get published in places like JAMA, 
because JAMA, just like everybody else, wants readership, wants press notice, and so forth. And they get it when they publish things like the latest thing in JAMA, which is that obesity supposedly cuts 20 years off of your life. That if you're fat in your 30s and 40s, according to this study, which turns out to be quite junky, you will reduce your lifespan 20 years from the normal. So you're going to be dying in your 50s instead of your 70s, according to this. Now, this is junk science on several levels, but Paul Campos, who's a columnist um, in the Rocky Mountain News and kind of my new hero of the week right now, takes a look at this study and one of the things that he brings out is how spurious the results were. Basically, he, he parallels this in his column to doing a study about lung cancer and high school dropouts and suggesting that if you did a study about relating lung cancer to high school dropouts without and saying that high school dropping out of high school causes lung cancer and don't look at or control for who is smoking among those high school dropouts then you've done a really poor study because high school dropouts tend to have higher smoking rates and it has been well established that there's a relationship between smoking and lung cancer. Not to mention smoking in pregnancy, which would be... Oh yeah, the other spurious one. Yeah, the one they always tell you in intro stat classes. Which is if... Go ahead and... Uh, there's a high correlation between smoking and pregnancy in teenage girls. One may infer causality if one likes, but then one would be dumb. Yeah, given that smoking doesn't cause pregnancy. So there have been several recent studies that have demonstrated that activity level is more important than obesity in predicting disease and predicting more mortality. In fact, there is a study that um, Francie Berg made reference to at the Cooper Institute that has demonstrated that, and, and Paul Campos makes reference to it without mentioning it, that has demonstrated that People with higher body mass indexes who are active actually have better health and longer lives than people who have so-called normal BMIs who are sedentary. And this has been true across the board, several different studies made by the Institute. What this suggests is that a great deal of the studies that link obesity with disease and early death are doing so without paying attention to exercise, without paying attention to how active the participants are. And if you would control for that in these other studies, what you might find is that the link between obesity and disease goes away and that it actually is more about how much exercise you take and how active a lifestyle you live than it is about how big you are. This is important sociologically because it is very difficult for stigmatized people to be active in society. There are restrictions on the kinds of exercise equipment that you can use because sometimes they're not built for bigger bodies. Uh, going down the street, riding a bike or walking or running often is met with ridicule. I've had people when I've ridden a bike around, when I've been larger, scream cow at me, scream pig at me, make rude noises and so forth. You have to be very assertive when you're a large person to exercise in public. Being active is more difficult if you are stigmatized for being big. Do you mean that people send mixed and even contradictory messages? Yes. To the overweight? Yes. You're amazed? Do I look amazed? No. But the radio people, the radio listeners, can't see you. 
Yeah, it's amazing how I can do that tone of voice without changing expression at all, isn't it? <laughs> it's a gift. Yeah, it becomes it becomes a catch twenty two in other ways too, and that is when things like this JAMA study comes out, and doctors read it, physicians read it, they very often have their own fat prejudices, and it becomes more difficult to get medical care because you walk in the office and the latest thing that they've read is that obesity kills. So the first thing that they want to do instead of checking out whatever it is, whatever symptoms you have, the first thing they want to do is make you lose weight. And so you walk in with all sorts of problems and you walk out with a restrictive diet. And there is also a growing body of research that is suggesting that restrictive dieting is in fact harmful to your health in many ways. It's harmful to your mental health, that's true, but it's also harmful to your body. Turns out starving yourself is not very good for you. Who knew? Uh, I can think of quite a few people. I would say that most people in the world have figured out that starvation is bad. Yeah. But Americans do it on purpose. Canadians do it on purpose. And that's really sad. I mean, I remember sitting in a diet group one time and listening to these women go on and on about how they were not eating more than a 1,000 calories a day and, and talking about how but they weren't on a starvation diet. This was a reasonable diet in their mind for a woman. A man it was okay to eat, but a woman it wasn't. And when I pointed out to them that the World Health Organization uses a 1500 calorie a day limit for, in other words, if they go into a population and the people in that area are taking in less than 1500 calories a day, that's the definition of starvation. That's where they start. So they, they say that area is suffering from starvation if the average calorie intake is less than 1500 a day. And yet there are I mean, I could walk out on the street, I bet, and ask a hundred women what they thought was a normal diet, and they would tell you between a thousand and twelve hundred calories. That's starvation. Women are starving themselves. Men are beginning to do it more often as well. And it's very sad. And I mean, that doesn't even scratch the surface that Francie Berg brought up about all of the other scams out there. I mean, the Slim Chance Awards were just amazing to me that there are still people out there selling all sorts of schemes. But, you know, I've tried them all. I mean, there are new ones, but nothing's new under the sun. I've tried them all to lose weight. And it's part of why I have problems now with my health. It just, it's aggravating. And it's aggravating to see it come up year after year, especially this time of year. So I want to leave, leave this on a positive note. I think that Healthy Weight Week is a great idea. I love that it's in January. I love that it's at the third week because that's about the time everybody gets sick of starving themselves and goes out and pigs out. And I love the approach that she's taken with this. My hope is that more people will start looking at this and thinking about it um, and begin to see that self-acceptance and accepting of fat people is more healthy than this annual ritual of um, deprivation. Do you feel less a person because you are under height? Are you unable to reach into high cabinets and shelves, making you dependent upon others? Did you know that under height people have more car accidents, probably because they are unable to reach the pedals and have trouble with seat belts? Studies have shown that being under height can take years off your life, make your quality of life worse, and keep you from the better jobs and more lasting relationships. It is time you took control of your life. Other height enhancement products offer you artificial means of height gain. At Jerry Riggs, we take a natural approach. You will meet with a counselor who has already been through the Jerry Rigg program and has achieved their height gain goals. 
Through our special diet and stretching exercises, you should see results in just 30 days. Don't settle for those two easy methods and don't do anything as drastic as height enhancement surgery. Just listen to our satisfied customers. I felt inadequate because of my under height. I refused to leave the house for months and was unable to get any dates or meet any women. I just knew I wasn't worthy of their love because of my under height. Then I went to Jerry Rigg, and in just three months I was six feet tall, and the women couldn't keep their hands off of me. I'm dating the entire cheerleading squad at my college. Thanks, Jerry Rigg, for putting love back into my life. After 911, I realized that being under height would make it impossible for me to help my students in time of emergency. I needed to be in better shape. I went to Jerry Rigg, and in just six months, I gained four inches. Now I'm a normal five feet, ten inches, and able to reach anything in my classroom that might save my kids from terrorists. Thanks, Jerry Rigg, for making me a better teacher. For years, I've been dependent on others to help me reach things in high places. My health has slowly gotten worse over the years. Then in 1992, I read about a study in Sweden that showed that shorter men were twice as likely to die as taller men. Twice as likely! I tried all the other height enhancement products, but nothing helped. I even considered height enhancement surgery, but luckily I went to Jerry Rigg before taking that drastic step. I went to Jerry Riggs' program, and in just six months, I gained five inches. My health is better, and by jingo, I am more of a man because I don't have to ask for help from anyone to reach things. Thanks, Jerry Rigg, for saving my life. Our program comes with a money-back guarantee. If you haven't gained height within 30 days, we give you your money back. Visit a Jerry Rigg clinic near you today. These results are not typical. In fact, these people were actors and have never used Jerry Rigg products. Money back guarantee covers only initial assessment fee and does not include any supplements or food products. Please check with doctor before coming to Jerry Rigg as we have no medical staff on site and have no medical background. Jerry Rigg cannot be held responsible for any accidents on the stretching rack. Results are temporary and do not last for long. Jerry Rigg cannot be held responsible for early death or injury due to Jerry Rigg products. Jerry Rigg waives responsibility for anything having to do with his products. In fact, Jerry Rigg does not exist. This program is for entertainment value only and does not represent the opinions of this station. Thank you.